friends happy whatever day it is uh it's wednesday uh, and happy to wednesday to those of you who are joining us online glad you're here part two of our uh jump back into season two of acts with my wonderful friends sisters colleagues laura and christine you this is where you'd applaud yeah very good very good and i hear that applause That's online right. thank you calm down calm down 
Uh, excited to jump in, excited to listen and learn from you both. Um, I'll just make mention that we're gonna take some time at the end for Q&A, so do not be shy in the chat. If you've got questions, drop them there. Even if it's questions from last week or where we're headed with the series or pertaining to tonight, we'll uh, make some plans to address that. And then also for those of you online, um, we have season two of our Common Room podcast coming up in the next few weeks. And this season two is the Common Room podcast, wait a hot minute. So it's all of the questions that you've had from the teaching, life, existential questions about God, shoes, whatever you want to talk about, they will be, <laughs> they'll be on there. All right, I'm going to pray and then uh, I'll turn it over to both y'all. Jesus, thank you for these friends, sisters, spiritual mothers in our community. We thank you for the gift of conversation, of study, of exegesis, and of the living uh, word that is Jesus and the written word uh, through the scripture. Thank you that we don't follow or study the Bible as a flat or static text, but by your spirit, you illum illuminate, bring to life, um, breathe life uh, into the reading of the word, uh, into the exegeting of the word, and into the speaking of the word. So may you speak through the words of both Laura and Christine tonight. May the words of their mouths and the meditations of their hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord. Mm. And we pray these things mm. in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Awesome. Hi, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. So we're staring at that mic. What's that? So we're staring at that mic. You can look kind of everywhere, but you just want to look there sometimes, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's right. Set. When I was teaching, I had one class that was grade eight social studies, and I had a student whose name was Dan in grade eight. And so for whatever reason, um, Dan and I did not get along uh, very much. He did not appreciate me as a teacher, uh, and I wouldn't say I totally enjoyed having him as a student <laughs> as the time started out. Um, and this went on for several months where every time that I would have him in class, uh, there was just kind of agitation between us. Um, and all kinds of different conversations resulted out of that. Conversations with his parents, conversations with him, of course, conversations with the principal, um, ongoing things where we were trying to kind of figure out this uh, situation, this behavior, but it was just bad. It was just bad. And I dreaded teaching the class that he was in because of it. Um, I found that he oft he just came with so much uh, attitude, so much disdain for me as well as the class. And it was, it was rough. And uh, for many months was this, yeah, stressful kind of ongoing thing that was happening in that particular year. And I was getting more and more frustrated by that situation as time went on, um, you know, and just thinking, oh, this is never going to get better. Like, I'm just going to have to kind of wait it out. And then eventually mm -hmm. this student will be gone. <laughs> but, um, but as weeks and months went on um, in reflecting on it, in praying on it, in kind of sitting with it in different capacities, my own heart posture in that situation uh, started to shift. And it was... All of a sudden, I'm sure, through the Holy Spirit, through God's leading, that I remembered something that I knew and believed before mm -hmm. about how with every different student, with every different situation that was difficult, if I, as a teacher, as the adult, could approach that individual um, with love, with interest in who they are, uh, with welcome, that that would shift and change uh, that situation. Mm. And somehow I had forgotten that or not acted on that knowing in this particular situation with this student, Dan. And so I sort of was returning to this knowing over weeks and months. And so it started to intentionally practice that with Dan, to come with uh, patience, to come with love, mm -hmm. to come with understanding, to come with seeing him, being interested in the things 
that he wanted to talk about. And it wasn't uh, like a flip of the switch, turn around, but for sure, as I entered back into that knowing that it makes a difference, that coming with love shifts the way that things are experienced, um, it did change the way that we interacted. And as it happens then, I taught him uh, again in grade nine, but in that transition as he graduated and then as I wrapped up at the school, uh, he came up to me at the end to say goodbye, and it was such a switch from what it had been between us, saying, you know, so thankful for you, Mrs. Jory, really appreciate you as a teacher. Um, and I was sad to not be teaching him anymore, too. And I never would have thought that that would have been the case <laughs> when it uh, started out. But this coming wow. back to something that I had known to be true uh, made a difference. Wow, and the power of the gospel working out in that messy time, right? Yes, in yes, your yes. Life. Well, welcome. Welcome again. Um, we're looking forward to continuing our journey in the book of Acts. And last week, you heard from Jimmy as he um, really powerfully declared some truths to us about the good news, that the gospel is the good news, and that in fact the gospel goes, that it is not stagnant, that it moves in order that it might include, and that the gospel is grace full of forgiveness and love and mercy. And so this week, we pick it up in chapters 13 and 14, um, where we see the church in Antioch is being led by the Spirit of God, and the, and the gospel continues to go forward in power. And uh, it's making waves everywhere that the gospel is preached. So that's where we're picking it up this week. But um, because of time, we're not going to read all of all, both chapters, but we will give a brief overview of the highlights in those chapters. And so here we go. So chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, starts with the commission of Paul and Barnabas, where the Spirit calls and equips and sends them off on their way on their first missionary trip. And so then, if we look, and you're welcome to follow along with us in chapter 13, in the next little chunk, if we're kind of taking it bit by bit, in verse 12, or sorry, verse 6 to 12, we see them set off onto their first missionary journey. And then this kind of wild encounter happens in this particular chunk where they engage with a Jewish sorcerer, um, and Paul gives an extremely strong rebuke mm -hmm. to what is happening in that situation. And so we're not going to spend tons of time in that particular chunk as it happens tonight. But if there's questions that arise there, you're welcome to raise them at the end of our time this evening um, or potentially in some of the follow-up conversations that you have too. But that's in that particular piece. Yeah. And then in, chapters, um, in chapter 13, verses 13 to 43, we have this beautiful and vivid story of Paul preaching in the synagogue. It takes place in the synagogue. And he is up preaching the message of Jesus and the power of Jesus' forgiveness. And he roots all of that message of Jesus right back in, the, in their history taking them back to see how God has been faithful to their forefathers in leading them out of Egypt, and then bringing it right up to date with these words. He says, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. So he's making it real for them right now. And friends, this is our message. This is the message uh, and the, the story that is our story as well. We Gentiles are beneficiaries of this very, very message. And we see after Paul does this preaching then, as we keep carrying on through these different chapters, in the next couple of chunks, we see this pattern of where they're continuing to preach wherever they go, Paul and Barnabas. And we see this back and forth pattern of some people receiving that message, some people responding and receiving, and then other people rejecting it. And mm -hmm. so they're talking about several different places that they're mm -hmm. visiting, different groups. And more often than not, it's the Jewish people, the people who would have known the story, the people who Paul's preaching to, hey, this is your story, that are not the ones that are receiving. Some of them do, but more mm -hmm. often it's saying, these are the people that were rejecting this message, that were not receiving it, um, and that it's the Gentile people that they reference in some mm -hmm. cases that receive that message with more joy, uh, that respond to it with acceptance as they go. Yeah. It's really neat to see just this up and down, right? And the gospel continues to advance, but it's not without opposition. And so we have here in, in these next verses in chapter 14, verse 8 to 20, <coughs> excuse me, where, Paul, where the, uh, Paul heals a lame man in Lystra. And 
the whole town comes out and wants to worship him and Barnabas, thinking that they're gods because of this miracle that's taken place. And he does everything to stop them. He could barely stop them. And then next thing you know, again, here's this uh, up and down, right? Next thing you know, uh, Jews from another town come and they incite the people to uh, stone Paul. And they do that. And then they drag him out of the city thinking that he's dead. That's right. <laughs> So we're all over the place. And then at the end of chapter 14, we're almost there. At the end of chapter 14, we see Paul and Barnabas return back to the place that they came from. And this is how these, mm -hmm. this particular chunk ends. So they go back to where they started from. Talks about how they're spending time with the church there for mutual encouragement, for mutual um, mm -hmm. uplifting, and that they've made their way back through encouraging as they go. So that's a super quick overview. Yeah, uh, so super quick. Not quite a... Jimmy's uh, 10 chapters in three minutes That's of right. last That's week. Right. <laughs> but I think we did okay. I think so. <laughs> well, this week, uh, we pick up the story, as we said, in chapter 13. And so if you want to um, go back to chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, and there's some really, really cool things there that we really want to just take a few minutes to pull out some of the things that stood out to us in these chapters and that speak particularly to how the church in Antioch um, was led by the Spirit and how the gospel of grace and inclusion uh, continued to advance as a result of this. So yeah, so let's pick it up, uh, verses 1 to 3 in chapter 13. I'll read those. Among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, called the black man, who read to that, Lucius from Cyrene, Menean, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. One day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. Wow. Just a little bit of context. At this point in the story, Paul and Barnabas have been at the Antioch church for a full year, teaching and encouraging these new believers, these new Gentile converts. So I love how this starts with one a day, right? How many good stories do you know that start with one day? And it just kind of tells you that this one day thing is gonna turn into something extraordinary, something beautiful, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. One day in the lives of these leaders, one ordinary day, a day though where they have included time of a prayer and worship and fasting and being with God. And in that context, bam, the Holy Spirit speaks. The Holy Spirit speaks in that context and he says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. And I love that this passage does not tell us who those words came through, right? Because that was not the important thing. The important thing, what mattered to them was that they heard the voice of the Spirit. They were able to recognize the Spirit's presence and the Spirit's voice mm. amongst them. And I'm sure that maybe the upper room experience, which had just been years before, um, helped them, right? Sensitized them. One com commentator said that those early believers were particularly sensitized to the voice of the Spirit. And that's a posture that we too want to continue, want to, want to uh, maintain and need to maintain in our lives as well. So the mission began, the mission began with the work of the Spirit. The Spirit is the one who calls and the Spirit is the one who sets apart. Mm -hmm. And the church in Antioch was being led by the Spirit. The Spirit is also the one who equips. I think much more time had passed than the, the passage really um, uh, lets, us, lets, in, lets us get a glimpse of. Uh, somewhere between 8 and 14 years it's been since Paul's uh, conversion took place, right? And for a number of those years, he was in Tarsus, his hometown. And I can just imagine that during those years, Paul was spending time just meditating in the scripture, being sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit, communing with God and listening and being deeply formed and deeply shaped during those, during those many years. And so this was the work of the Spirit equipping Paul for his lifelong work of, being, of ministering to the Gentiles. And then we see the Spirit sending out Paul and Barnabas. 
and, and, and giving them purpose. And I love this because in this context, we see the communal God at work here. We see that the Holy Spirit doesn't just send Paul and Barnabas out on their own just by commissioning them at, in their own homes or whatever it was. And I'm sure that, that it started there. But he also now brings them into the community and invites the whole community to participate in the sending of Paul and Barnabas. Mm -hmm. He invites them into this, not only the sending, but, but in so doing, inviting them into the responsibility, into those that would pray, those that would be a covering for Paul and Barnabas as they go out on mission. And so we see this beautiful, beautiful inclusion that takes place in this scene. And I can imagine that this was just a tender moment where the family of God, the church, gathered around Paul and Barnabas and led by the Spirit, they laid their hands on them. They mm -hmm. laid their hands on them and blessed them and commissioned them to the work that the Spirit had for them. So, we get to see that equipping played out now in the stories that we'll be looking at a little bit as we go on. We get to see the wisdom and mm. the boldness and the courage that comes as a result of the Holy Spirit's equipping in Paul and Barnabas's life. So mm -hmm. why don't you take us there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we start with being filled with the Spirit, being equipped by the Spirit, and then this particular chunk of the narrative that we're looking at in chapter 13 and 14 gives us tons of pictures um, into the messy middle that happens as we start to work out what that actually looks like. So, equipped and filled by the Spirit, moving into the space of actually living into that purpose, and we see, as, you kind of, as we referenced when we're doing that quick overview, so much back and forth, so much tension between kind of opposite experiences as they go, this sort of ebb and flow, this both and that is very much in their experience. And so we want to mm. just draw out a couple of those things from this particular piece of the narrative that we're looking at together. And so the first kind of ebb and flow that we can see is one of celebration and opposition. So as Paul and Barnabas are living into this calling that the Spirit has very much equipped them for, we still see that there's both celebration and opposition as they go. And so if you want to look in chapter 13 to verse 42 and 43 to start... We'll pick up little snippets all along as we go. In verse 42 and 43, we see an example of one time that there was celebration. Paul finishes giving his sermon, giving this invitation for them to pay attention to Jesus and who he is that we'll come back to. And then we see in verse 42, as they left the synagogue that day, the people begged them to speak about these things again the next week. Many Jews and devout converts uh, urged and Sorry, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, and the two men urged them to continue to rely on the grace of God. So we see celebration that's there. We see acceptance. We see a desire for more. But then if we look um, a few verses later in chapter 13, verse 50, we see that as they continue in the same kind of vein, that there is opposite reactions that happen. Mm -hmm. In verse 50, it says, Then the Jews stirred up the influential religious women and leaders of the city and incited a mob against Paul and Barnabas and ran them out of town. So th the point for us here in this ebb and flow is that they're carrying <coughs> on, right? They're carrying on, equipped and led and filled by the Spirit, and they have no control over the reaction. <laughs> Mm -hmm. They have no uh, assurance of what the reaction mm -hmm. will be. And in fact, they get reaction on both sides. People who accept and celebrate, people who want nothing to do with them and want them to get away from them as quickly as they can. So that's one mm -hmm. piece of the messy middle. A second kind of ebb and flow or this back and forth that we can see is in staying and leaving, which follows a similar kind of vein. But if we look into chapter 14, there's a repetition of these things as we go through these verses too. If we look in chapter 14 at verse 3 and 4, we see here an example of their staying. So now they've arrived in a new place for their preaching, and the apostles stayed there a long time, preaching boldly about the grace of the Lord. And the Lord proved their message was true by giving them power to do miraculous signs and wonders. But the people of the town were divided in their opinion about them. Mm -hmm. So here they are, preaching, living into the purpose that the Holy Spirit has equipped them for, and they decide to stay, even when it's hard. In this instance, they decide to stay for a long time, continuing mm -hmm. in that work. 
But we'll see a few verses later in verse 6 and 7 that when they learn that they are deciding to attack them and stone them again, that there's this plot against them, then they flee to a new region. So there's a time for them to stay and there's a time for them to go. And that in both of these things that they are living into the purpose that God has before them. The last back and forth that we want to draw out that we can see here is one of um, the way that they respond to the people, the way that Paul and Barnabas respond to the people that they're engaging. And so we see a spectrum of response through this particular part of the narrative where sometimes there is encouragement, Mm -hmm. sometimes there is exhortation, sometimes there is full-on rebuke in terms Mm -hmm. of the spectrum of how they're engaging with people. And so let's look at a couple examples there too. Back to the verses that we just read a few minutes ago in 1343, we see Paul and Barnabas encouraging people to carry on. They're saying, yes, you have taken a hold of something good here Mm -hmm. by believing in who Jesus is, by wanting to know more of this. And so keep on, persevere in this learning and this knowing, continue to rely on God. We see them bringing encouragement. Mm We see exhortation a little bit earlier in that particular chapter. So exhortation, this kind of very like directed encouragement to this is where you need to give your intention, give your attention. So we see that back in verse 38 of chapter 13. Paul has finished preaching and there's these different reactions, different questions and responses. And he says, brothers, listen, brothers, listen, we are here to proclaim that through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Mm -hmm. Everyone who believes in him is made right in God's sight. And so there's this direct encouragement in a particular direction. And then as we referenced quickly earlier, we saw in the beginning when they come across um, this Jewish sorcerer who is having an evil and deceptive influence over one of the political leaders in the area, Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit in Mm -hmm. verse 9, filled with the Holy Spirit, looks the sorcerer in the eye and says, you son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, an enemy of all that is good, you need to stop now. And then he ends up uh, striking him blind. So Mm -hmm. empowered by the Spirit, living into the purpose that God has called him, sure of what God is speaking to him to do, he speaks rebuke. And so we see this full spectrum of response um, as they're engaging with the real people and the purpose that God has called them into. Mm -hmm. And so when we're thinking about all these back and forth, all these varied reactions, all these varied experiences of when to stay and when to go and when to encourage and when to exhort and all the rest, we want to come back to the things that we started with when we're looking at these verses about how they are equipped and called and filled Mm -hmm. and sent by the Holy Spirit. Because these are not decisions that we can or should be making in our own strength or our own Mm -hmm. capacity. It will be a mess. It will be a mess when we do that. Mm -hmm. And so this is, we need to lean into such strong dependence on the leading of the Spirit in order to know the way forward, Mm -hmm. in order to know what the best response is, what it is that God is calling us to. And of course, it's still going to be imperfect. It doesn't mean that every move that they're making as they go is the exact right thing in the exact right moment. They're human. They're regular, (laughs) like Mm -hmm. us. And Mm -hmm. so there's a release there. But the scripture also tells us, over and over again that they were listening to the Spirit, that they were Mm -hmm. filled with the Spirit, that they were dependent Mm -hmm. on God's leading, and that is what is compelling them in all of these different reactions. Mm -hmm. We see that it's as they go often, as they engage, as they move into these spaces of ministry, that the equipping and wisdom and leading of the Spirit comes. Mm -hmm. And so that's a good encouragement for us too. We often want to know for sure before we go, (laughs) which is also super regular. But when we know that we have been filled and equipped, then we are all Mm -hmm. called into that as the people of Jesus. As we go, we can trust and lean and depend in to the Spirit equipping us. Mm -hmm. And I think another significant thing to pull out when we think about the purpose that they've been called to, what they're equipping, Their overarching purpose is to strengthen and build up the church. Their overarching overarching focus is to point to Jesus. And Mm -hmm. so as they go, that's always the goal. As they're following the Spirit's lead, it's moving them towards love. It's moving them towards unity. It's moving them towards truth. And so we keep that in mind as we're engaging in those messy middle places. Yeah, yeah. 
I find it really interesting that the fact that they were called and equipped and sent out by the Spirit does not mean that, that things would go smoothly, right. right? It was right. not just a nice smooth road ahead. But indeed, it, it was as they entered into these messy spaces, that messy middle space, that they saw the actual working out. All the, the rhythms of listening, the rhythms of being in prayer, all of those things then, under the surface, brought wisdom and understanding mm -hmm. and being able to know when that spectrum of from rebuke to encouragement right. they needed to be, right. right? But the important part, I think, of this little bit here is just the recognition that the disciples, no matter what was happening, they were pointing, they were looking for every opportunity to point people towards Jesus, mm -hmm. not to any institution, not to mm -hmm. the, even the church, but they were looking to point people towards Jesus. That's right, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's right. contrasting with some of the things we were chatting about uh, earlier. Yes, that's right. Sometimes, um, like we see again in the passage, how the people want uh, Paul and Barnabas to be the focus, right? Mm -hmm. And they're saying, no, it's not about us. Mm -hmm. It's about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so for us too, as we're following into the leading of the Spirit, as we're going and expecting that the Spirit will equip us, that he will lead us, that we will know what to do uh, one step at a time, that we can also come back to that and say, it's not about people looking to us. It's not about mm -hmm. building up a particular church. It's not about supporting a particular point of view. Point of view that the goal always is for people to see Jesus more clearly. Mm -hmm. And that should be our motivation. That should be the end result if we're yeah. walking in step with the way that his spirit is leading. And we see Paul and yeah. Barnabas coming back yeah. to that again and again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's so these uh, snippets and stories that we've been uh, hearing and just looking at um, are just a smaller bit in a much greater narrative, right? There's so much more that's been going on that we don't, don't necessarily see here in these passages, but these stories and these snippets are given to us as a means of encouragement for us to continue on in the sharing of the good news of grace, the good news of Jesus, and to know that in that we are never doing it alone, right? Mm -hmm. We are always fueled by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, and he will always give us what is needed in that moment. And so this, uh, these stories to me are just pointing us in the direction to say, go forward, go forward, because you can do that in the power and strength of the Spirit. And so no matter what the challenges are or what the oppositions may be, stuff does happen when we step out, right? Stuff does happen, but the power and the presence of God, the power and the presence of Jesus through his Holy Spirit is with us as we do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think back to the story that I was telling you about Dan and how sometimes the things that we have known to be true in the past, in a particular moment, often a moment of challenge or angst of some kind, can feel like it's not enough can feel mm -hmm. like it's too simple, can be easily forgotten when we're kind of consumed in a moment where we don't know which way to go or things are not working out um, how we would want them to. And But I think, again, the reminder here is that there are straightforward things that we know that continue to ground us and show us the way forward. And so we see that we need to be dependent on and equipped by the Spirit. And we see that we want to always be pointing to Jesus and that these become the kind of like guardrails yes. of our lives as we do the going then, right? Mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of stuff in the middle. <laughs> there's all kinds of stuff in the middle. We see it in this in just these two chapters, that it's back and forth and there's ebb and flow and there's all kinds of mess, but we can kind of hold fast to this being equipped by the Spirit, always pointing to Jesus as our goal. And when we're not sure, we feel like things are not working, we don't know how to engage well with a particular person, we come back to these places that we have known to be true. We come back to this place that we have known how to walk in. We come back and root ourselves there again, and that will instruct us, that will guide us, that will show us the way to engage in those middle spaces. And it will be imperfect, mm -hmm. but if we're relying on the Holy Spirit, if we're pointing to Jesus with every opportunity, it will be good. It will be good, mm -hmm. even as it's imperfect. Yeah. And we will learn more and more yeah. about God's character there. We will learn more and more about who he has called mm -hmm. us to be there yeah. as we step into that place with faithfulness. Mm -hmm. So why don't we close with uh, a prayer? 
together. So yeah, just do that. Sounds good. Hey, Jesus, we just thank you for the power of your gospel. That is such good news. That it encourages and inspires our hearts to move forward and to share what you have done in our lives and the power of your risen life, what that means to all of us, and what that means for this world right here and right now in our context. Lord God, we thank you for not sugarcoating the stories that we read, but um, just letting us see the reality and the power of the Spirit to move through difficult spaces and oppositions. And um, sometimes some of the oppositions are not outside. Sometimes they're in our own minds and Mm. uh, things that we're struggling with internally. And so, God, we just pray that uh, you would again reignite and fuel the the flames of love for Jesus in such a deep and profound way that we would be yielded to your spirit and, and, and determined to be led by your spirit into the mission field that's around us, whether it be with our families, our friends, um, our neighbors, our co-workers. Mm-hmm. Let your gospel of grace go forward in power, I pray. Mm-hmm. And would you use us in that context as well. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Mm-hmm. Thanks, friends. Okay, we'll give uh, maybe just 20, 30 seconds for a deep breath and uh, <laughs> some time to think through what we're processing. Quiet in the chat, so deep words. Um, but yeah, you still have some time if you got some questions that you want to to bring us back to. We're happy to wait for a couple minutes. I'm gonna run away. Yeah, and Laura's gonna run away. We can be praying for our sister Laura, who's yeah been working through some fun health challenges, and today was just a tough day. So we're gonna yeah. wish you grace and peace and health. Out for some tests tomorrow, which will be okay. We'll yeah. So I'll sit in and grill Christine. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, really. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll start here in the room. Any questions or... Comments, thoughts you want to share? I've got one just in terms of the, I always find it interesting, just the the superstitious kind of like magic-y culture that mm-hmm. especially Acts is written in. Uh, and lest we think that like, oh my goodness, that was then, this is now. I'm, I'm fascinated and would love to hear your further thoughts of, around like contemporary application of mm. a gifted communicator and leader in Paul and Barnabas who want to be worshipped by a crowd and mm-hmm. the like warning shot that is, for our church even today and where that takes us. Mm -hmm. What would you say, Christine, in terms of advice of like how to differentiate between a gifted communicator, leader, Mm -hmm. whatever, who who is empowered by the spirit, but then is also curbed towards or consistent with pointing back to Jesus, which I loved how you guys Mm -hmm. end with that. What would you say? Yeah, well, um, I'm thinking back to the start where um, the spirit spoke in those early verses and we have no recollection, no record of who who, actually gave those words, who he actually spoke to. And I think that is such a key thing for us here, no matter how gifted, there were a bunch of gifted men in that room, right? It names them all, (coughs) excuse me, and there were probably others, but the spirit spoke and it was not about that person. And I think today in our culture, church culture, it's just natural that we want to put somebody on a pedestal. We just want to do that, right? We we live in a culture of superstars and movies and celebrities and all of that, with your favorite music artist, whoever, you're willing to pay whatever to go see to all of that stuff. And so we're, we're prone to that. But I think the scripture is recognizing that and even in that context is showing us it is not about that. And so, to have the humility as a leader to say, I am really just one among and not one above. 
I think is a critical thing. I think it's a critical thing for us as leaders to, yeah. to see ourselves as one among, no matter how incredibly gifted we are, that that is just a tool for the spirit to use. Yeah, that's good. You know? Really good. From the chat, um, Chris asks, and then we'll come to you, Paul. So we'll go Chris, then Paul, and then Lisa. Chris asks, question for Christine, how do you then personally work through the messy middle of the, of the Holy Spirit's work? How do you work through the messy middle of the Holy Spirit's work? Mm. Yeah, that's a little bit of a wide question, right? Because <laughs> there's so many, so many messy middles that I face. And um, I don't know if you, if it's Lisa that's asking this question. Chris, Chris sorry. Um, I don't know if you have something particular in mind, but um, I find for myself, depending on what's going on in my life and what the mess is that's in my life, a lot of what I need to do, Laura spoke a little bit about that, is coming back coming back to the things that I've, that I've known. Because sometimes, even though you know it with your head, you forget it in the middle of the mess, right? And it's not functionally working. So you might know it in your head, but and you may even say it in your head at the time, but then I find that taking time out, like we saw the picture of these um, leaders doing where they had a rhythm, right? Where they had set time aside to be quiet with God so that they could actually hear the Spirit of God. Because sometimes even just hearing the words in your own mind is not sufficient. Sometimes you need to sit in that space where the Spirit of God then realigns you mm. and brings you um, centered in that messy middle, you know? And I've had that situation even just this week where I felt so <clears throat> discombobulated for who knows what reason. I wasn't even sure what the reason was. But I just went to God and said, this is how I'm feeling. I'm feeling totally out of whack. Internally, I feel guilty for I do not know what reason. You know, just stuff's going on. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and I just asked God, I said, would you realign me? Would you realign me? And I literally, not a word of a lie, <laughs> felt internally like the spirit was going like this and realigning me. And then he just said to me, go for a freedom run. And I literally went out. <laughs> and had a freedom run, you know, where I just called out the things that I knew to be true. Again, going back, just like Laura was sharing earlier. Yeah, that's really good. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> yeah. I just have a question for Christine. I mean, you make it sound that the Spirit's so, so mystical. I mean, it does say that there was prophets and teachers, and there were many things happening. Mm -hmm. Don't you maybe think that... Um, there was actually people that were being attentive to what was taking place. Yeah. And they are the ones that basically were inspired just because of what they saw. Yeah, the evidence for sure was. You know, Absolutely. It, I don't think it was just a, a mystical voice. Someone oh, no, did no, speak no. it. No, I didn't at all um, mean to indicate that, uh, that it was just a mystical voice. What I did say was that we, didn't, we weren't given through whom uh, that particular word came, like, you know, which one of the number of which us. Which is good, because say, it could which, have been exactly, anybody. Yeah, right? Exactly, that that's the point. That's that it. Yeah, that's totally. Antioch too. Well, mm -hmm. I find that, like I come from a Pentecostal background, mm -hmm. and I can tell you straight, it is, uh, it is almost sad to be able to, to make it so mystical, yeah. so unpractical, because, you know, if we are truly living in a corporeal world, the spirit does flow through us, Absolutely. But we have mouths and we have hands and we have feet to be able to respond to that. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot that we couldn't cover because of time in this, right? But if we could, I would have been saying exactly that, yeah. that uh, the Spirit is working directly through us. And I hope that that came out, mm -hmm. that the Spirit is working in the midst of these people. But there was a need to be attentive, right? There's a need to be discerning and attentive where you know what the difference is between what I'm just saying because this is my bias or my interest or whatever it might be, or it might be even just be good. But then sometimes there's a place where the Spirit gives a clear-cut word, like this word, set apart for me, Paul and Barnabas. Like, that's a direct and specific word, right, that the Holy Spirit gave. And for the, the company that are together to recognize to have the discernment to recognize that that's not just somebody wanting to send off Paul and Barnabas on a mission, but that this is really the spirit advancing the mission of the gospel, right? And they had that ability to hear that. And we do too. We're invited into that space. The spirit is alive in, in all of us, right? And as we gather together, 
We need to be discerning to hear when the Spirit, attentive, to hear when the Spirit is speaking through any one of us as we gather together and to be able to respond and to act. That is how he's at work right now in the world. It is through the believers, the followers of Jesus, right? The Holy Spirit is in us, mm -hmm. That's good. alive and active. Yeah. Um, Lisa asks, um, <coughs> so what do you do about not feeling your belief in Jesus? Hmm. Yeah. That's a really good one. <laughs> not feeling your what, belief in Jesus. What do you do Jesus? about not feeling like yeah. your belief in Jesus yeah. when you just doesn't feel like mm -hmm. it's, it's there? It's more, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, Lisa, mm -hmm. but yes, you're, you're speaking my language here. Yeah. Yeah, I have, I mean, again, I, uh, when I came back to faith, two of my best friends were from, you know, a Pentecostal tradition, and they're like clicking off on feeling the spirit and this and the other, and I'm like, I don't get any of that. So this mm -hmm. is fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lisa, thanks for asking that question. That's a really, um, it's a question that a lot of people have, right? That you don't always feel it. Well, the reality is I don't always feel like I'm married either, right? I don't always feel this or I don't always feel that. <laughs> but it doesn't change that it's a reality. And I think uh, our faith is so rooted in truth that it doesn't, um, it's not to say our feelings don't matter, but our feelings can change all the time, right? And, um, and knowing, and that's why it's so good, one of the reasons it's so good to be soaked in the scripture, because then you can always come back again to what you know is true. And you can come back, sometimes we're also not seeing um, all the amazing things that God is actually doing in our lives. And so we're not, we're not necessarily taking note of them, right? Mm -hmm. And that sometimes can hinder us feeling um, whatever it is we might be looking to feel. But the reality is that once uh, your, your faith, once you have believed in Jesus, you are. You are um, belonging to him. You are his child. And that's a reality. And he's going to give you all the things that you need, the wisdom you need, the underst whatever it is that, that you need, whether you feel it or not, it is coming. It is coming because he's faithful and true. It's not dependent on you. It's dependent on him, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, agreed. I would also say just like f f for me as somebody who also has uh, historically struggled with doubt, um, <coughs> find people, seek out people like, yeah. like Christine, you know, and I don't say that glibly as people who are attuned to and walk and step with the presence and the power of the spirit, the voice of the spirit, the prompt of the spirit. Not all of us are gifted in that specific way. Some of us have different uh, gifts to serve, to lead, to teach, to evangelize, um, to cook, uh, and some of us have special wisdom, you know, so f for me, um, and I would also say, Lisa, like, I, I just so identify with these questions because there's also a beautiful, haunting, terrible, wonderful tradition uh, in ancient Christianity and present of the dark night of the soul, mm. of the dark season of the soul. It's like, I don't understand why this is. And unfortunately, in lots of those ancient traditions, Mother mm -hmm. Teresa being uh, one of those, Alpheus being one of those, um, Augustine being one of those, mm -hmm. Thomas Merton being one of those, contemporary mm -hmm. mystic, all of whom have said, there are times and seasons in my walk of faith where it just feels like darkness. Mm -hmm. Why is that? And mm -hmm. the sad news sometimes is that there is no respondent answer, but the good news is there is respondent community where it's there might not be the, the solve all answers, but there are arms around. There is the body of Christ. If it's not the word of Christ, it's the body of Christ mm -hmm. that's like coming yeah. around us, which has been my experience. Mm -hmm. Good brothers and sister friends in the faith who I'm like peppering them with questions and none of their answers in my estimation back then that were like, this is not really good, but even better that they were like, but I'm willing to walk with I'm you. Here. Like I'm just with I'm you. So... <laughs> You know, let's just sort this yeah. out together. You are not alone. This yeah. is my unique calling in your life, Jimmy or Christine, whoever. Uh, but you are not alone. And let's just yeah. keep, keep at it. Yeah, keep at it. Yeah. And just to say, I too have experienced dark night of the soul. Jim can attest. My husband can attest to that. Um, yeah, deep, deep dark nights of the soul that, that were ex overextended period, yeah. right? But, um, but I would also say that during those times, there were times where I had to be carried by others. Yeah literally had to be carried by others in, uh, on, on their faith. And, uh, but, the, but 
one of the beautiful things that can come out of the dark night of the soul is that it makes you desperate for God, mm. desperate to just experience him. And, um, and, and that has been my story. And it looks different for everyone, right? And so, Lisa, just to encourage you not to compare it because it looks different for everyone, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, but yeah, be in a community. Find those that can be um, a, a source of strength and encouragement to you would be a really important part. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a good place to park it for the evening. All right. Yeah. Thanks, friend. Thanks for tuning in. Um, we hope to see you next week. And grace and peace and light and love, spirit, all of the things too. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.